Uh, I, I've had some crazy limiting beliefs, I think. Uh, I just think, I think limiting beliefs kind of make you quite an interesting person. I wonder if when I was a teenager, so I was dyslexic, and so there was, nobody ever really expected me to ever amount to very much. And I think that that limiting belief of I'm not good enough actually resulted in me publishing five books. So I think sometimes our limiting beliefs can actually serve us in lots of ways. It's if it becomes obsessive. If it's, if it's like I have to keep driving myself to create books or I have to keep driving myself to become bigger and better, that's when it becomes out of balance. So I think, you know, crippling limiting beliefs, you know, the things that really stop you doing the things that you would love to do, the things that there's never enough room on a gravestone for excuses for. That's tragic when you live a life and you, you've let your limiting beliefs kind of in a sense make the decisions for you and, and, and not allowed you to live fully. And this is certainly why I became a practitioner in matrix re-imprinting because it's the only modality that I've come across that I really resonated with that gave me the opportunity to help clients go back into their past come up with why they came up with particular beliefs and, and actually undo through meridian tapping um, some of the um, brain melding of stuck ideas, start to loosen them up and start to think, what if? Sometimes the way to unblock a limiting belief is just to think, what if? And to use your creative imagination and think, what if this was different? What would my life be like? Because you don't know. You don't know what your life would be like if you were living without this limiting belief. So why would you go through the pain of risk? Because your limiting belief is always going to be the thing that keeps you safe. You need your creative imagination to start going, ooh, I wonder what my life would be like without that. And then from that buzz of the initial excitement of potential, it suddenly starts to become worth the pain. Worth the pain of dealing with your limiting issues becomes worth it because you have built a future in your imagination that you want to step into. But sometimes the removal of the belief is actually the removal of a safety mechanism with no good cause. So that's why we hang on to our limiting beliefs. We created a limiting belief because at one point in time we did that in order to keep us safe. So we have to find other ways to keep us safe or get really giddily excited about the future in order to be able to move past those blocks some of my own limiting beliefs. You know, I, I very specifically teach people not to look for their limiting beliefs because they're invisible. Um, and, you know, if you go around claiming this is mine and this one's mine and see this one, then you start arguing for them and installing them further and you'll need a crew to undo them. Good luck. So I don't really approach it with limiting beliefs. Clearly, obviously, that I'm stuck in this body. I'm, <laughs> I've got human beliefs. Uh, I celebrate that I'm stuck in this body. It was one of my choices, no doubt, and still is, or I wouldn't be here. But when I have issues and challenges, which undoubtedly are brought about by limiting beliefs, instead of trying to figure out what they are, my be limiting beliefs, I get really clear on what I want, uh, what the end result is, and I start doing stuff about it. And when I'm doing something about it, you know, you'll invariably bang your head into the wall, you'll slip and fall, representative of tangling with uh, limiting beliefs, but you'll learn how to find your balance, you'll learn how to walk straight, you'll learn how to get to the other side where the dream can come true. And in the process, whatever was out of alignment in terms of your beliefs must, by law, fall into alignment or you're never going to get there. But I know I'm going to get there and I know what my dream is and I know what I want and I'm doing something about it. And just the doing something about it um, counters and negates a belief that says won't work, can't do it, too dumb, too tall, too bald, too what, uh, too whatever. Uh. And so uh, you, we can all manipulate and mold our beliefs into ones that serve us. Still, most of them will be invisible by having a dream and moving forward and not taking no for an answer. Hopefully I have fewer limiting beliefs than I used to, but we all have them. Um, I used to have this, I had this belief that I was an outsider. I had that for years. And then recently I spent three weeks on an ashram, so I'm digging away at this. And I discovered it was actually deeper than that. It was, I am unacceptable. 
And um, there's a technique, this technique which I mentioned called completion, involves identifying what that is. And this may sound bizarre. You then identify the incident when it first came up, in my case, my first day at school, and you rehearse it in the mirror over and over again. And eventually, your mind just gets bored of it and it goes. Amazingly powerful. I think a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again until you hardwire it in your brain. And I think all beliefs come from past experiences. And experiences brand circuits neurologically in the brain, and they produce emotions that condition the body. So we have beliefs about money, about spirituality, about relationships, about love, about cultures, about parents, about God. <clears throat> but that's because we've all had past experiences that are, that's now in our biology. So when we have the experience, then we tend to think within the neurological circuitry, and then we produce these corresponding emotions, and how you think and how you feel creates a state of being. So our thoughts and feelings based on our memories from the past really cause us to think and feel in the past. Now if you keep thinking and you keep feeling and thinking and feeling, if you take a series of thoughts that are connected to feelings and thoughts connected to feelings and thoughts connected to feelings, it's called an attitude. So if you have a series of good thoughts that are connected to a series of good feelings, you say I have a pretty good attitude today. If you have a series of negative thoughts that are connected to some bad feelings, you say I have a pretty bad attitude today. So you can have a good attitude in the morning and a bad attitude in the afternoon. So an attitude is a shortened state of being. Now if you clunk an attitude, an attitude, an attitude together, that's called a belief. So imagine if you keep thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking and thinking and feeling more extended states of being. The redundancy of that cycle conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind. So beliefs then are subconscious states of being. People don't even know they have beliefs about things because for the most part they're, it's programmed subconsciously. And we only really become aware of our beliefs when we're challenged by our environment. So. Of course I have beliefs. I had a big belief about time for the, forever. Like, I'm busy, I never have enough time, there's never enough time. And then I realized that all of that was based on my past experiences and my environment, of course, was re reminding me of it. And so I decided to change my belief that I live in no time and I accomplish everything. Better belief. But in order for us to change a belief or perception about ourself and our life, we have to make a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that's greater than the hardwired programs in the brain and the emotional addictions in the body and the body has to respond to a new mind. In other words, the choice has to become an experience that you never forget. And if a choice produces an experience, an experience produces an emotion, and it's an elevated emotion, which means it's an elevated energy, then the moment that occurs you create a long-term memory. And that's when your past biologically and neurologically and chemically no longer exists in the body. So <clears throat> the snake charmer who gets bit by the poisonous snake and has no blood coagulation, or the fire walker who walks across the coals, or the preacher in the deep south of the United States that moves into a state of religious ecstasy <clears throat> and drinks strychnine and has no biological effects, or the mother whose child is trapped under the car. She doesn't say, Oh, I ate some carbohydrates today and I haven't worked out in two weeks to lift that car off the child. The decision has a level of finality and it's energy that's the epiphenomenon of matter. And when we come out of our resting state and we have an inner experience that's greater than any past experience, that's the moment we're no longer defined by the past and that's when the belief changes. Right. So limited beliefs are a massive part of my work. Uh, in terms of what I have as limiting beliefs, currently I don't have any. And the reason I say that is, for most of us, we don't recognize our limiting beliefs. It's only when they kind of, some, often somebody else points them out to us, or, or somebody shines some light on them, and then we go, ooh. And then the question is, what do you do about it? Now, my work is about changing limiting beliefs, particularly around health, about what's possible for people. So I know lots and lots of tips and, and tricks to do that. Um, for me, I've had lots of limiting beliefs in my life. Everybody has. And the first thing to do is become aware of them. When you're aware of them, then you can do something about them. And the first thing is to recognize them not as truth, but as an approximation, an old model that kind of worked pretty well for a long period of time. 
but when it starts to fail you, it doesn't produce the results you want, that's, that's when you look at it. And the other important thing is the only person that keeps them alive is us, so therefore we have complete power to change them. Uh, I have masses of limiting beliefs, or I certainly did. Um, I'm a work in progress. I, I certainly had um, extremely limiting beliefs around money. Um, I, I grew up in a, in a household where it felt as though money was extremely scarce. Um, and, and also the sense of self-worth was very much linked to money. For me, I think it, it still is. I would never in a million years, never mind how much money I had, um, you know, spend 400 quid on a pair of shoes. Uh, I couldn't contemplate it. Um, it, just, it. It just isn't me. Um, so the whole thing of money and self-worth is very, very linked for me. Um, I also think that was a very self-limiting belief in terms of me being able to imagine what what wealth and abundance I could bring into my own life. Um, but I think I have been able to uh, move forward in that in that belief. Um, how I did that, I think I just got in touch with recognizing those limiting beliefs and also getting in touch with that sense that actually, you know what, money is energy and, you know, there is enough abundance. Um, and uh, I've done quite a lot of work on that now and it's one of the things that in my own work I, I try and help other people with as well. I mean, we always, we, we learn what, you know, we teach what we're meant to learn ourselves, don't we? And uh, I do a lot of work with, with therapists, practitioners, coaches, authors, um, and I really try and help them grow their business. And it's fascinating in so many cases that money is the limiting belief. And once they can get beyond that and recognize that money isn't dirty, um, they, can, they can move forward and it's, and it's usually a, a, a massive breakthrough. So that was a big one for me. And one little tip on that is one really cool thing to do is just treat yourself to a new purse or a new wallet. Um, something really lovely, something that, you know, it's very beautiful and um, it's, uh, it can be quite magical. Um, I could spend probably an hour talking about all the limiting beliefs that I grew up with. I feel like I grew up in limiting belief family. Uh, so I feel like I'm spending the whole of my life undoing limiting beliefs. But, you know, the biggest ones would be probably I'm not lovable, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. Just a few of the big ones, you know. So I think I feel like I'm spending my whole life undoing limiting beliefs and stepping into more life-affirming and positive beliefs that, you know, support my happiness and support my service in the world, really. Some of my limiting beliefs, well, I'll tell you, I... Before, when I, in my early days of, of writing, before I actually started writing, but when I resigned from the pharmaceutical industry uh, several years ago, I had these big dreams of, you know, I was listening to Wayne Dyer audios and I thought, I want to do all that kind of stuff. And I hadn't realised that I, I was sabotaging my own possibility of even writing, of, of being successful in any way. Because I had this belief that if you're successful, you never get to see your family. Yeah, that you'll have to be out travelling all the time. And I didn't realise, it was just, you know, we've all got our things, that we, crazy little things we develop in our heads. Because I think I maybe, I grew up in a very working class environment. And, and everyone that I knew that had money was always really busy. And they came in at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night and didn't see their kids. And I, so I had somehow got in my head that that's how it would have to be. And so I prevented myself from having any degree of success, any time there was an opportunity for something, I somehow tripped myself up. Not physically, but you know, you, you stumble, you say the wrong things, you end up missing it completely. And I did that for quite a few years actually. Just my own fears, until I broke through that and, and realised that it's really up to me. You know, and, and as, you as you move and thrive in your life, you get to make the rules. You know, unless you believe someone else gets to make the rules. But if you, if you don't accept that someone else makes the rules, then you really can adapt things and work things in a way that, that works for you and your family. That's kind of what I'm learning now. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, in terms of limiting beliefs, I don't know that I ever bothered moving through them. Like, it just never occurred to me that it was relevant what I thought. So like, I, I, I remember when um, I found out that my, my wife was, was pregnant, I just was about to open my first West End show and in my head, I'd been sort of brought up to believe that 
as soon as you had kids, you stopped doing what you wanted to do and you started living for the next generation. So for me, I didn't want kids until till later, at, at the very least, once I'd done my thing. So this was sort of the worst thing that could possibly happen. I remember phoning the, um, the, the Samaritans. Um, I was so bleak about it. And they said, you know, what's up? I said, oh, my wife just told me she's pregnant. And they said, congratulations. And I just said, do you think that if congratulations were in order, I'd be phoning you. But at the same time, I kind of knew I'm usually wrong about everything. And so it, it, just, it just wasn't that big a deal. So the fact that I thought my life was over didn't really stop me from doing anything. And I mean, I've joked before that if I, if I ever do write like a spiritual autobiography, it's going to be called, Who Knew It Would Actually Work? Because I just, I just don't. I just, that's not where my head education was something I, I tried hard at, but I didn't really know how to do it very much. And so I'd say those, that myth of inadequacy, if you like, and I call it a myth of inadequacy because actually the feeling that you're not enough is just a belief. And it's important to attend to that belief because when you attend to it, you get help. And then when you get help, you begin to see that, that actually... Maybe it's not that you're inadequate, maybe it's that you don't know yourself well enough yet. And that actually if you really paid attention, you would discover that you have your own brand of creativity. You have your own brand of intelligence. And it might not fit the mainstream, but never mind. Let the mainstream be the mainstream. And you get on with being who you are. And I think that's what I've really had to focus on over the years. I think that's a huge one that most people have, is that I'm not enough in some way. I don't know anyone that feels that they're completely enough. Completely. I agree with you. That myth of inadequacy, that, that what's often described by psychologists as an ego deficiency, it, it comes, I honestly believe, because we're trying to be normal. And normal has a terrible track record on our planet. It's not really worked, so let's not do normal. Let's do a, a new normal, uh, a better normal than we've had before, a normal way you can express your, your uniqueness, um, not for the sake of being different, but because your uniqueness is an authentic act. It's what helps you to be true to yourself. That's what we need a little bit more of in the world today, people being true to themselves. One of my limiting beliefs has been you have to do things perfectly. A lot of times we think that's a great belief. We think that it makes us a better person, but in reality, it's that perfectionism that keeps us living in fear, keeps us feeling it's never good enough, and keeps us from taking risks. One of my limiting beliefs is that uh, I'm scared of being the center of attention. Uh, when I was at school, I faked illness for over a semester and a half because I couldn't stand the thought of reading out loud in English class. The irony of it is that I now make a living by doing public speaking. And one of the ways I got over that uh, limiting belief was, someone, someone once told me, if you have a fear, then you need to make your purpose more important than your fear. So when it came to that particular limiting belief, uh, I realized what I want to do is I want to tell people that peace is possible for them. So I need to make that purpose of making sure people know peace is possible more important than the fear of standing up in public speaking. And for me personally, when I make my purpose more important than my fear, well, the purpose prevails. So that's one way that I overcame that limiting belief. The second way you can overcome a limiting belief like fear of public speaking is to actually just get out and do some. Uh, but you don't actually have to talk in front of 800 people. Uh, when I first started, uh, I did my in a way, apprenticeship in public speaking. I had a little spiritual uh, meeting house uh, nearby where I used to live and, and uh, I did an evening class every Thursday for two years. And I had like three people in the class, uh, every, but, but it didn't matter. I was having an opportunity to, to practice and practice and practice. And so over time, uh, naturally through repetition, you, you can overcome that sort of uh, belief. But yeah.